thank you for the introduction. I welcome you to my talk. I will talk to you about the radio labeling of nanoparticles, specifically silver, titanium dioxide, and multi-wall carbon nanotubes. You see here there are a lot of people involved. In short, uh, these are the people who gave the money. These are the people who did the work. And yeah, um, this was funded by QNano, and I'm actually representing two projects that we did at the JRC in ISPRA, uh, where we used uh, the, the cyclotron laboratories. We were guests uh, of the nanobioscience unit um, led by uh, Dr. Neil Gibson. I want to thank you, uh, to thank Neil Gibson uh, and the group for having us and all the support. And yeah, what we did there is, as I said, radio labeling using their cyclotron facility. And um, what I will show you are the results of basically the two methods um, that we tried on our particles. Um, we use commercial uh, available um, nanoparticles that we want to label uh, for tracing um, experiments. And basically we would try two methods. Um, the one is proton activation, where basically a nanoparticle gets irradiated with protons and then one um, radioactive isotope is formed inside the nanoparticle. Um, the second would be recoil labeling, um, where a compound different from the nanoparticle is irradiated, undergoes a nuclear reaction. This produces a recoil and this recoil uh, incorporates uh, the radioisotope in the nanoparticle. So let's begin with the proton activation. Um, first, you have to look, if you have the particles, you have to look, is, are there any useful um, nuclear reaction that you can uh, use? Um, for the silver, um, there are actually two uh, reactions that both lead to, this, uh, to the uh, buildup of this silver 105. Um, for the titania, um, we can produce vanadium-48 by proton irradiation. And um, for the carbon, um, we have this exotic P3D so a reaction. So uh, one proton in, three deuteriums out. Um, we produce a beryllium-7 isotope that is then incorporated in the, in the uh, CNTs. You see here uh, the half times of these uh, isotopes. It's very important to have knowledge of this. So basically, uh, you should choose your reaction or your label. Uh, your label. Um, you want uh, to have time to work with it, so it should be convenient to work with, and it shouldn't be around forever. So with these um, half times, this is possible. Um, if we look at the cross-section for these nuclear reactions, um, we see that these are um, uh, possible with the energy, proton energy that is available at the JRC cyclotron. And what else can we see here? Um, as for example, the decay mode of these particles. Here we see these are actually positron emitters, which uh, in principle enable um, positron emission tomography, um, which is also planned. We haven't done this yet, but we want to do. And yeah, here you see um, what we do. This is basically a column of soil and is, that is about to be put in our positron emission tomograph. And this is then what we get out of there when we do a flow through um, experiments. Um, this is a placeholder, so this is no data from uh, particle transport but it's um, potassium fluoride uh, go, uh, flowing through a, s a fractured salt core. Um, but in principle, this would be possible with the titanium dioxide and the silver using these methods. So how do we do this? We um, used these experimental uh, conditions that were developed by our colleagues in, at the JRC. Um, we use their cyclotron, and the nanoparticles are basically uh, put inside this target capsule and then irradiated. 
for eight hours mainly or even longer and what we get is yields of here around uh, seven kilo becquerel for the titania even um, two mega becquerel and here only uh, four kilo becquerel per milligram um, um, to put the to translate this into uh, non radiochemist language this comes to these detection limits and here you see uh, especially for the titania um, we are in the nanogram per liter uh, range so these are exceptional low detection limits that are uh, available to us and yeah the next step is um, you have this activated you also have to check if it's stable so this labeling wouldn't uh, help you at all if it's not stable inside the particle and so what we see here is uh, leaching experiments where we just had uh, the particles uh, in solution of different pH value and then we uh, we watched uh, or we looked for the release of, of radioactivity and we see here that basically um, the release is uh, very little so this is these are stable uh, particles the um, the little release that is that is because we cannot uh, or it's difficult this is done by centrifugation um, it's difficult not to suck in uh, uh, some particles that you measure um, then uh, when you establish these values so furthermore you want to uh, establish that you didn't change the particle properties and yeah we have done this uh, with SEM or, and we measured the size and zeta potential of the uh, particles and for the titanium dioxide and the multi-wall carbon nanotubes um, we didn't see any changes so there were slight changes for the multi-wall carbon nanotubes in regards to the Raman spectra but it, it was not really a big change that we, we saw um, that we decomposed it by the irradiation into amorphous carbon so they are still nanotubes um, unfortunately for the silver that is not the case this is highly sensitive to the energy input so nano silver will eventually melt already at somewhat uh, 80 degree and during the uh, irradiation you get elevated temperatures and so well exaggerated statement would be you put nanoparticles in you get a mirror out and um, so yeah there they will melt they will cluster together and so you will have a, a, after the treatment uh, the irradiation you have a poly dispersed um, sample of microparticles so moving on to the recoil labeling um, here we see what we use or what we basically do is here we uh, it is not the goal to irradiate the nanoparticles but we irradiate a mixture of the nanoparticles and a lithium lithium compound this would be lithium hydride for example and what we do use is the nuclear reaction PN reaction so a proton in a neutron out from lithium to beryllium 7 um, this is the, the reaction cross-section and here you see the principle again so we irradiate um, the nuclear reaction takes place in the lithium compound um, the, the nucleus will get a recoil energy and will move through the sample and will eventually be uh, incorporated into a nanoparticle or at least some of them so these are the experimental procedures um, for all our um, particles that we tried see here the uh, uh, proton energy with 4.34 micro uh, mega electron volt uh, again the principle and what you get is after this of course we cannot just take the material we have to wash the residual lithium uh, away and also most of the activity will actually be uh, 
not inside the particles, but in uh, in the mixture with the lithium and will be wa washed away. So these are uh, diagrams of the washing steps. And yeah, there you see that basically this is the release, the accumulated release um, that we wash away up to 90% of the produced radioactivity. And um, yeah, don't be confused that the first washing steps uh, don't produce uh, much release. These are uh, the capsules. When we have irradiated them, we will open them um, under uh, ethanol. So the first washing steps are also under ethanol, and that doesn't produce a, uh, or that doesn't wash away that much. But then we go uh, to water, and eventually this is a acid washing step to remove any residual uh, lithium hydride, and this is where the main loss of activity comes. You can also see um, the, that the loss of activity, of produced activity, is actually correlates with the density of the material. So the silver particles, um, basically, they are uh, denser than the other particles, and so they can stop and catch more of the beryllium cores that are flying through the sample. So these are the yields, and yeah, basically here it is the same problem um, for the beryllium, uh, for the multi-well carbonyl tubes and the titania. We didn't see any changes in properties, but for the silver, uh, it's uh, the same problem as before with the temperature. So, but now to summarize this, um, I'll give you the, the yields and the uh, uh, detection limits that come out of it. And yeah, I told you it's mainly useful for the titanium and the multi-well carbon nanotubes, especially for the titanium, the proton activation here, where we uh, get detection limits of nanogram per liter. Um, yeah, for the silver, we have these detection limits, but of course they are not nano anymore, so we have to think of something else. And yeah, if you want to know what we thought of, I invite you to check out my poster where I show uh, different methods for radio labeling, also silver, uh, without, with conver uh, conservation of the properties and the size. And yeah, so now I have told you the results. And of course, we don't do this just for fun. I want to um, tell you something of why we do this. And our project is basically um, to study the life cycle of these nanoparticles. Um, we have uh, different partners and we cover the whole life cycles from the, this is motivated basically by a company that produces uh, surface coatings and also uh, incorporates nanoparticles in these surface coatings. And then we study the release uh, of these nanoparticles. This is done by our colleagues at the IOM, this is the Institute for Surface Modification in Leipzig. Um, we do the, uh, check the environmental fate and the transport of the nanoparticles, and the EAWAC in Zurich uh, will investigate uh, the impact of nanoparticles on benthic organisms, so uh, nematodes, that is. But f of course, for if we want to do this, and we want to do this in a relevant fashion, so that means in low co at low concentrations, we have to use the radio labeling, and what we pr do at the Hard Set um, we basically provide the radio labeling for the other partners, and of course, this is also now happening with uh, in cooperation with the JRC, we are the Kunano funding, and yeah, here I will show you some um, results. Two minutes, okay. <laughs> Some results um, um, of these. These were actually so. These are release studies of nanoparticles from surface coatings, and what was used were these directly activated uh, titanium dioxide particles. What you see here is basically um, surface coatings and how they degrade um, with UVA radiation. And yeah, here you see this is. Uh, what is uh, usually done 
in these kind of release studies, you do a worst case scenario with a, a surface coating that you won't be able to buy because it, yeah, it's, oh, I don't know, it sucks. So, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it degrades fastly, and there you see the ma after eight days, the matrix is basically gone, and there are the nanoparticles. A more realistic case, you see after 10 days, you don't see any change with the, uh, in the electron microscopy pictures. So yet, if you look at it with the, our techniques, um, especially in the realistic case, you see with the radioactivity, we see a 4% uh, release or even 6% release um, um, that we could not measure by, uh, with conventional method. Uh, ICP OAS, for example. Um, so we see a, uh, a release of nanoparticles, um, even though we don't see any visible degradation of the matrix. So, and yeah, here you see the uh, pictures from auto radiography. Um, this is basically the picture from the start, and then you see um, these fields where there's less black. This is where the nanoparticles get released. But again, we don't see anything happening in these spots with uh, uh, SEM, for example. So, and that I want to conclude. So, at the JRC, we did um, uh, radio labeling using cyclotron methods, um, specifically the proton activation and the recoil labeling, which are mainly useful for the titanium dioxide and also. Uh, for the multivolt carbon nanotubes, so that for silver, it's, it's not that useful because of the energy intake. And the main point is that by using these radially labeled particles, we make previously unmeasurable phenomena detectable. So this is the release of surface coating uh, of the titanium dioxide out of surface coatings. And with that, I want to thank again the funding of Kunano, the BMBF, DFG, all the colleagues that were involved uh, in producing these, these results. Um, again, colleagues at the, the colleagues at the JRC for the help and support, and thank you for your uh, attention, and the organizers for uh, letting me talk. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. I think we have time for one question. Thank you. Very interesting. <clears throat> I want to know, um, after a proton um, activation, your, your particles are uh, beta emitter. Are they uh, can they be used safely in the milligram gram uh, uh, amount usually, or they have to be uh, somehow, you know, they, they become re re reactive to a, a health effect. Uh, they yeah. can have an health effect. Well, of course, they are radioactive. So um, when you want to handle them, you have to uh, have expertise in this and have a controlled area. Um, so if you want to start research in this field, I would advise you to maybe first uh, seek out a collaborator who already has a controlled area. For example, you can apply uh, via Kunano for the JRC, or we are also open for cooperation. So, yeah, and of course, if you plan, for example, um, toxicology studies, you will also have, of course, to control your experiment that um, the radiation doesn't kill your cells in the end, um, but at these low, activities that I have here, this is unlikely. Go on, it looks quite urgent of, of a very quick place. <laughs> Thank you, Jacques Bouillard. I was wondering, when you, um, you activate your, your particles, uh, how, how do you make sure that they activate it on the surface or really down deep in the, in the, in the, in the central part of the particles? Do you uh, have well, we haven't checked like how far the, the radionuclide is inside the particles. What I can say is that it doesn't come out. Um, of course, you should, as I said, for uh, toxicology purposes, you should uh, 
check, because uh, especially if you have beryllium in your sample, um, if it is at the surface, maybe this can have an, uh, uh, this can have results on your experiments. Um, yeah, um, we have checked zeta potential, for example, so if the surface would have changed considerably, one could also imagine that the zeta potential would change. Yeah, just, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I think we should uh, move on to the next presentation. I guess there's plenty of time over the lunch and in the clinic to um, do some more detailed uh, scientific discussions. That was, that was very nice. Thank you. <laughs>